welcome to the Built on Air podcast, the variety show for all things Airtable. Each episode, we cover four different segments. It's always fresh and different and lots of fun while you get the insider info on all things Airtable. Our hosts and guests are some of the most senior experts in the Airtable community. Join us live each week on our YouTube channel every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And join our active community at builtonair.com slash join. Before we begin, a word from our sponsor, OntoAir.com. Any business running on Airtable gets the value that Airtable has, but also needs a few more functions to complete their operations. That's where OntoAir comes in. It's a suite of tools for any business running on Airtable to maximize your operations efficiencies and automations. One customer, John, states that OntoAir enables his business to function properly without having to think about building their own software, and that is pretty invaluable. The OntoAir Airtable apps are amazing, and we use them often and are very happy with the results. So join John and hundreds more customers and take your Airtable to the next level with OntoAir. Sign up today with promo code BUILTONAIR for a 10% discount. Check them out at OntoAir.com. And now let's check out today's episode and see what we built on air. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Built on Air podcast, season 10, episode 9. Good to be back with you. Got myself, Dan, and our regular hosts, Camille and Allie, with us. Welcome. Hello. Good to see you guys again. And we're good to have everybody back with us live or watching on YouTube. As always, to have everybody back with us live or watching on YouTube. As always, the Built on Air podcast is roughly an hour long uh, podcast that we do live every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And we always go through four segments. I'll go through briefly what we're going to be doing today. We always start off with round the basis, talking about what's going on, keep you up to date on the Airtable news and highlights. Then we'll do a spotlight on our primary sponsor, On To Air. Then we'll do, Camille will go over an audience question and answer that uh, on the show. Then I will do a highlight on an app, the Auto Rinker app from the Marketplace. Then I'll do a highlight on the Built On Air community. And then finally, we're going to end with the Air Chefs. We don't do this too often, but... It's kind of fun. We'll have uh, Camille and Ali go head to head on building out on top of an existing base and see what they build with it live in the short amount of time. So excited for that. So let's kick it off with round the bases. This was actually a relatively slow week. There wasn't a ton of um, interesting topics that, that I discovered this week. So we'll see what we have to talk about. But first, I want to um, give a shout out again to Ben and Chris uh, that are putting on the unofficial Airtable user conference called Daretable 2022. Uh, check it out at daretableconference.pori.app. And this is April 8th and 9th in Austin, Texas. It's in person. So I will be there. Camille, I know you said you're thinking about it. Allie? I bought my ticket. Um, okay. I bought my ticket to the conference. I have not bought my ticket to actually go there. Yeah. So and I don't have any sort of arrangements of where to sleep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I am fully intending to be present in some capacity. Uh, awesome. Yeah, same. It works You're out. Awesome. My husband had, we're going to New Orleans already for the 9th through the 11th. So just going to head down south a couple days earlier and it'll work out. All right. Very cool. That's a little bit more of a trip for you on the East Coast, but um, cool. So all three of us will be there. We'll do we'll do a live uh, Built on Air podcast from there. And uh, hopefully that we can see more of our listeners down there. It should be a good event. I know they're still in the works of finalizing uh, speakers and sponsors and everything. So we'd love to see you all there and um, should be a fun event. Okay, next, there was an announcement from Airtable. There were some changes. This came out, I believe, the uh, the day after the day of our last week's episode, so we didn't uh, cover it. So uh, new additions to the interface designer. Did, did either of you dig into these new changes? You want to go over them? 
Um, a couple of them. So uh, the biggest noticeable change is that they've added a gallery view component, um, which is pretty nice. It allows you to sort of set how many cards will appear on the page. So you could you could have a paged component as opposed to it running forever because a gallery view could end up quite long. Um, there, you can group the sidebar in um, the record view layout thing. That thing is still only available if you choose that template at the start, which is a little frustrating, but you can, uh, you know, it's it's more, um, they added a, a bit more functionality to it. So hopefully that eventually gets uh, made available to um, other interface layouts. I haven't played with charts yet. There's the, they're, they're calling this an enhancement. They're, they're really just letting you group a line chart, which you can already do in apps. And then they, for some reason, didn't let you do it in interfaces. And now they are. But cool. I was like, kind of cool, exciting. Mm -hmm. I would have expected it to already be there. Sure. <laughs> yeah. What are the difference between um, the gallery view versus inside an interface? Are there any major differences? I didn't detect any that were you know significant other than it being paged. So instead of running on into infinity forever, um, you know, you there's... can also you can choose the title. Oh yeah, that's what, that's very nice. Yeah, definitely. That's that's huge. So. If a lot of people like, you know, I, I typically use a formula for my primary field. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people don't like to have something super long there because it's unattractive and you can't have it in a gallery view because it's just a long name and not super pretty. But here you can switch it out with something nice. Nice. So you can pick a different field or just manually? Uh... You can pick a different field, which is super cool. Yeah. So that functionality is available for the timeline view within the regular Airtable interface, regular Airtable experience, yeah. <laughs> I'll say. Um, hopefully the regular gal uh, gallery view gets that feature as well, that you can pick any field as the label. Yeah. And I would love to, I love how you can um, bold and italicize and underline things in the timeline view, like, mm -hmm. hey, when you pick what field do you want? I would yeah. love that functionality in other views of types as well. That would be yeah. awesome. Yeah, that would be cool. So yeah, that's that's the big one, gallery um, functionality and grouping. So you're saying, so that kind of concerns me because it's like if they add more functionality that's only available on new interfaces, you're like, do I want to invest a ton of time? if I can't use new functionality with an existing interface. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. And I wish, I, like you said, Camille, I want, I, I want to be able to use that record review type within an interface, like use it as an element to like drag on to the mm -hmm. page. Like I would love to be able to, I, I love the idea of being able to choose a record and like the record picker dropdown is kind of, it's okay, but like, I'd love if you could like, you know, click a record and then have it open up or, or something kind of like the record review does. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So new stuff to, to play with still definitely um, some things missing, obviously the ability to update or create records, or I, I should say delete or create records. Mm -hmm. Um I think it looks like there's a couple bugs that people pointed out as well. Um, but it is good. We, I think we talked about last week that like we were worried because they hadn't touched it at all. And then that same day they came out with some updates. So they are working on updating interfaces. So we're starting to see it. So hopefully there's more to come. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. All right. So check out that. Um, moving on. This I thought was interesting. I think I brought this up as well. I noticed this. Um, so they sent out an email. They usually once a month will send out an email from Airtable saying what's new, what's going on in Airtable. And Patrick pointed out that um, in the email, it references this custom field syncing, but then it doesn't talk about it. So it just talks about, you know, it kind of just says, 
I saw it in the subject line of the email that I got um, saying, you know, what's new interface design functionality, like we just talked about, and then custom field syncing. And, but then it doesn't talk about it in the email and there's no reference to any article or anything of what this mysterious custom field syncing is. Any, any thoughts? I think it's, it has to do with when you, when you sync a source, whether that's, you know, from a sync integration or from another, like a table review from another base, you can customize what fields you're syncing over. And so you generally, it starts with whatever are visible in that view, but then you can actually fine tune those fields. I think it might have something to do with that. Like that's, that's what the header is when you're looking at the sync configuration, it says customize your fields uh -huh. that are syncing. Yeah, but hasn't that been there from the get-go? Yeah, it has. So yeah. I don't know what they're talking about with improvements to it or... Well, re reading what uh, Rebecca's comment is, she's mm -hmm. hoping that um, we could change the type of data that is synced to the table. So some fields will come in looking precisely as they do in the original uh, table, but other fields are converted into just plain text. So maybe the hope is that, you know, fields that come in that don't necessarily make sense to still be um, whatever they originally were, um, you know, maybe you could have that be converted into something else. I don't know what that would look like per se, um, but yeah, the, it's perfectly vague enough that I don't really have a clear grasp of what it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's just a, a game. If I worked in marketing for a large corporation, I'd like put these references to random things that don't exist and <laughs> let people speculate on it on podcasts like we are. Well, it's working. So, yeah, we'll see. Maybe, you know, maybe there is something company coming and they weren't quite ready to launch it, but it was already in the marketing and they forgot to remove it. That's what I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. We'll see something like that. So if you work for Airtable and want to give us insight on what that means, we'd love to hear it. Or if you have your own guesses, put it in the comments and we'll see who's right. Maybe you'll get a uh, sandwich from Airtable. <laughs> All right, last one. Uh, this is from our Built on Air community. This comes up quite a bit. Uh, the question over here on the right from Russell, a workaround for triggering an automation on create or update. Um, and Jen has a, has a thought on a formula field that puts the latter of the two created or updated and then sees if you can trigger off that field. Um, any thoughts on how you deal with uh, an automation that you want to trigger on either creation or update? Um, that sort of idea makes sense to me. Um, I think it's been, it's, it, it's one of the following. When you create a record, the created time automated field will fill in, assuming you have one. And then I don't think the last modified time has a value. I think upon creation, it's just created time and there's no modification. So your formula could do if created time and not modified time, then output the text created. Um, if last modified, time then output update what you would also probably have to bake in there is um, if you're wanting to trigger an update based on a text field you'd probably want some latency in there because you don't want if you're trying to type the word the when you type in t that's an update so if you want to wait until you finished your thought you probably have to do if last modified time is more than 10 minutes ago or something like that. Yep, absolutely. I I feel like there's usually a way to get this to work. I mean, depending on what the use case is, right? Like, so what exactly they need to do with it? There might be like, if this field is empty or if this field doesn't match this field, then that'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, so if, yeah, but usually a simple, all you have to do is say, if last updated time, use last updated time else use created time mm 
Mm -hmm. right that gives you kind of the either either or right um, well, you could just have it go when a record is updated and just watch that one field because it lets you watch formula fields yep right right yeah so definitely doable a couple different ways you could do it so hopefully that helps russell i'm going to sneak one more in i i just remember this one i didn't have this but we're going to add this this is an interesting discussion on reoccurring fields or reoccurring events kind of like you think of a calendar event that that reoccurs it's pretty common you know project management you might have a reoccurring task or something and andrew's asking about you know if airtable has any plans i definitely don't see that happening like scott mentions um i doubt that ever becomes native um, but there's definitely like ben mentions ways to do that in automations thoughts on reoccurring events how you handle those i mean I, what i would probably do is i would probably just make a google calendar and make reoccurring events in there and have that synced into my base um because hmm. then they'll google will do the reoccurring thing for me and they have an engine that is specifically designed to handle reoccurring events and Airtable will just interpret that if you try to do it the other way around you're going to have to build in multiple like single select fields that's like does it reoccur yes if so does it reoccur every day every week every month and then from there it's like every one day every two days yeah. every five and then you have to start dealing with the first of the month or the last of the month, or if you want to get more complex, the first Tuesday or the last Wednesday. Like those are <laughs> things that Google's figured out that you will have to build for yourself in Airtable with a series of complex formulas, which could be written, but like, do you want to? No. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a, I guess, probably a little more simplified, like, no, I, I mean, first of all, I love that solution. And I've been using the, the new Google Calendar Sync table. Mm -hmm. I really love that. Um, another another option would be like just if you have a start date and then you have a frequency field like weekly, whatever, and then how many mm -hmm. times. And then you could write a script that would just duplicate or like add however many records to whatever table. Yep. Yeah. Does, uh, does the Calendar Sync with a reoccurring will it show up like as a duplicate yes. uh, record it does mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think it i think the sync will look a certain amount of time in the future so mm -hmm. it will cap how many events will appear in there but they will come in as individual events interesting i thought it was weird that you have to tell it i mean i, I guess it's not that weird because then when would it stop right if you have a recurring event that just recurs forever then you have to you have to specifically tell the sync integration what date range you want for that table. Mm -hmm. um, I did it for, to like 2024 or something. I'll just have to remember in two years that I have to add more time to it. Is it a hard coded date or can you say X number of somethings from now? It's a hard coded date. Mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. Yeah, you think it would be a rolling two years or something? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> everybody's it's going to break when they set, have that date in there. They're like, where's all my events? Right. <laughs> That's funny. You could set up a service to remind people when their date <laughs> ends. <laughs> set up an Airtable automation. Yeah. Uh, Jen had a suggestion as well. She, she uses kind of a formula of... Um, when records need to be flagged or recreated or something. So you can use uh, date formulas to, to flag when something is up for renewal or something like that. So there's ways where you could do it within a single record entry, which is another good use case. So good stuff there. This is definitely, um, I've done it, you know, using automations. One thing I've done is I, I, I've worked with, um, loan companies actually a couple like loan agencies um and we sometimes they need things to trigger like days after the loan was created but sometimes they need it to be days before like the loan is due and so sometimes you you will set up automations that say this runs 
X number of days before the end date or X number of days after the start date. And you can kind of create some automations that factor in things like that. So there's a lot you can do, but typically it does require formulas and automations. Um, and it's so varying. Everybody has different use cases that I really would be surprised if Fairtable built that natively um, into a formula, into a, you know, field. So I don't think that's coming anytime soon. And then last, Justin, who's listening in. For tasks, I build a system that allows lots of reoccurring tasks, but I just reuse the same record. Yeah, so you could reuse the same record and just update the, the dates or create new records for each time. So that's another thing that would make it difficult to know exactly how people want to use it. Good stuff there, Justin. So I believe we have one more. Oh yeah, we already did that one. Okay, so that's, yeah, we had a duplicate there. That ends our round the bases. So with that, we're gonna do a spotlight on Onto Air. Onto Air is our primary sponsor. It's an all-in-one toolkit to run your business on Airtable. It's a suite of apps that extend your Airtable business. And so if you're running anything, um, anything core to your business, you need to check out on to see how we can help you and make sure you're running smoothly on Airtable. So for today's spotlight, I want to highlight a new case study that was added recently by Hannah, who just joined, joined our show live. Welcome, Hannah. She uh, is working on a few case studies. This one is regards to our Amplify app. That is an app that runs inside of Airtable. It's in the marketplace. You can find it and it's kind of an alternative approach to interfaces, but actually does a lot of things that you can't do in interfaces. One of them is being able to um, go deep into your attachment fields and interact and loop through um, all your records. This is a pretty cool case study of our friend Jeremy. Um, maybe one day we'll get Jeremy on the show and he can show us how this is built out. But you can see he he works in a machine shop. They've got lots of equipment that they keep track of. And he uses Amplify to interact with all of the data all on one screen. You can see their advanced uh, PDFs that, that you can go through. We actually have the ability to annotate PDFs inside of there. That's a new feature that was recently added. And you can interact with link tables all right there along with your core tables. So. If you're working with a lot of different data, um, you can build some pretty cool interfaces with Onto Air Amplify. So check it out in the marketplace. Um, try it for uh, 14 days for free and see if that is a fit for your business. So Onto Air Amplify is today's spotlight. Next, we're gonna do audience questions. So Camille, if you wanna get your screen ready, you're yep. gonna walk us through question asked on the Airtable community. There you go. So um, this question is actually from yesterday or the day before. And um, essentially this person had a single select field that somebody fills out when they're completing a form and they wanted to assign a point value to whichever selection was made. So the solution that they started off with was um, when a record was submitted, it would run, um, it either they would run a script or they would transport it to an automation that would run um, upon record being submitted from the form. Um, and it would run this script to look at what is the option from the single select, and then it would convert that into a number. But there are a couple of things that I noticed about this particular use case that I thought needed addressing. And I chose this question for um, the podcast to sort of walk through how I feel like sometimes we overcomplicate things. So for starters, um, this script was looping through every record in the table. And based on what they described, it sounded like they only needed to convert the new single select value into a number and the other records that are already in the table don't need to be edited. So first off, we don't need to loop through. 
And that's sort of why they were running into the original error they were getting, um, 15 mutations per second. Basically, the script was doing too much in too little of a time. Um, so it was looping through every record in the table and updating each record one by one. A, you could have done that in batches, so update 50 records at a time. And B, you only needed to rec update one record in the first place, so that's not really necessary. Then, um, looking at the way they've sort of set up their single set options in the first place, they all start with a number, and it's being converted into the same number that it starts with. You don't need a script for that at all. So aside from the script being a little bit inefficient, um, I just sort of recommended that they do this in a formula. And I gave four different formulas that would have accomplished the same thing. So the first you know, few paragraphs were me explaining like, you don't really need a script for this and your script is looping too much. And then the rest is me sort of going over what your options are in terms of if you wanted to do this all within a formula, which would mean you don't need an automation at all. You can start with the switch fo uh, formula. You could also, there's, there's actually five formulas you could do. You could do a really like nested if statement, but that would be silly. So skipping that option entirely, if you start off with a switch, you would feed it what your single select field is. And then with each option that is available, you would output whatever you want. Um, so in this case, if you said one very dissatisfied, give it the value of one. Do that for all of your options. And if the field is blank, then that uh, would output just a blank from your switch field. If you wanted to cut to the chase, you could just use the value function um, on that same single select field. So what value typically does is it looks for all of the numbers within a string and takes those numbers out um, and then converts that into a numeric output. The reason why it's in an if statement is it's checking to see if there is any, if this field was filled out in the first place. Um, it's just sort of helping with error handling. If you wanted to be a little bit more precise, um, you could include the left function in here. So what you could do is just do left of your single select field, and then I did two, you could do one. I did two because in case they wanted to add more and get to 10 options, right. that would be accounted for. Um, but you could just do left single select field comma one, and then that would give you the number. I still put it in a value because I wanted the output to be numeric. Left will give you a string, um, which means it's harder to do math on it uh, or to you know, apply it to a chart or something. So that's why value is still there. And then I put in the fourth formula as I called it using regex for ambiance because <laughs> we've solved the problem three different times already with much simpler formulas that people understand. No one understands regex. Uh, but if you wanted to do- Obviously you do. I don't because I I guessed and it was like, I don't know. Re regex is, um, there's a lot of particulars that are difficult to remember. So um, what it's doing, very similar to the other, uh, the other options, but it's taking that original string value from the single select field. And then what this is, is it's sort of the nomenclature for any non-digit. Um, and then what the plus is saying is any one or more non-digit characters. So anything that's not a number, replace that with nothing. So we're extracting everything that isn't a number. Um, and you will technically end up with the same solution. I've sort of ordered it in terms of um, each option that I gave in which option will get you what you want in this particular use case um, with as minimum number of edge cases. Um, and then just for an example, I've sort of duplicated that functionality over here. And you'll notice here's that option with the left formula. Here's one that's just the value. Here's one with the switch. And here's one with the regex. I'm just gonna reorder I think I think that's the order that I put it in before so you'll notice that for all of these they end up precisely exactly the same these are some other single selects that kind of point out why uh, there's pros and cons to each 
So with the switch value, because I only accounted for the one through seven, um, none of these are that, which is why there's nothing. For value, again, what it's trying to do is take every single number um, and then getting rid of everything else. And what you end up with, this is a multi-select field actually. So it's taking that five, four, zero, zero, that one, zero, four, zero, zero, zero. It's making it all one number. That's not what it technically is based on you know, this option. Uh, you'll notice it worked correctly for this one because it just takes these numbers and promo is not a number, so it's not included. Um, you'll notice it runs into a problem if you tried to use the left option because now you're working with, with this particular example, this isn't what the, the user had, but I'm demonstrating why this, which formula you select might vary based on what your particular use case is. If you had a multi-select formula and you try to get just the left two, but your values actually look like this, you're going to have a problem because the left two is going to actually be a quotation mark and then the dollar sign. And then it's the five and then the comma and the whatever, which is why this is a zero. There's no, there's no value to extract from a quotation mark and a dollar sign. That's why all of these are zero apart from this one. Um, and then regex was like very difficult to work out for a, um, multi-select field. If this were a single select field, it would have come out much more clean. Um, but just sort of demonstrating how you tailor examples of formulas. You could, you could apply four different formulas and ar arrive at the same situation, but there's, those same formulas might not work to the same degree for every single similar use case. Mm -hmm. So long story short, you didn't need a script. You just needed one of several formulas. Right. Well done. Well done. I think the biggest thing, and I, I know I've run into this is I always, I think I'm less willing to use a switch statement as I try to avoid those because it doesn't like those formulas are great when you need to add to it because they can support as long as you stick with the same syntax. Whereas if you add another entry into your drop down, then you have to go and add it to your switch statement, which mm -hmm. you never remember to do. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I know it's, I'm guilty of that. It's something as simple as like, if you misspelled the word dissatisfied and yeah. then you made your switch statement and you go back and recorrect yeah. your dissatisfied, it still has the value of two, but the switch is looking for the word dissatisfied spelled wrong. So right. that's something to keep in mind. Um, the value function doesn't doesn't care. So maybe this that one's probably the most reliable um, of the four when we're in this kind of school of thinking, just sort of, just give me just the numbers, just the numbers. Yeah. Um, and that's how you end up with that. Cool. I'll, I'll, I'll point out Justin had a question about which on the regex were you do, using a capital D or lowercase d? I was using a lowercase d. Yeah. I think if I did a capital D, then it is everything. Lowercase versus capital would I think yeah yeah capital D would extract the numbers. I wanted right. to extract the non numbers. Right, right. Um, and that those are the nuances that you have to remember with uh, regex, and I, you know, yeah. no, don't do very, it. Very sensitive. So, yeah, we could you could uh, spend a lifetime learning regex. <laughs> I've run away every time. <laughs> yeah, very good. Cool. Thank you for uh, sharing that, Camille. Mm -hmm. okay. And. Before I'm going to, I'm going to do an app a day while I'm doing this, I'm going to excuse Camille and Ali, and they're going to be working on the um, air chef challenge while I'm going through this so that they'll have something to share in a few minutes. So while they're doing that, we're going to spend some time talking about an app that you can get from the, uh, from the marketplace. So today's app that we're going to be talking about is called Auto Ranker. If I go here, um, you can get this in the marketplace. Just go to 
um, ad from the marketplace and then find this one and install it. Um, I don't know who it's from. It's from Time Savers. You can go, uh, they just have the on Gumroad. This is a paid app. So um, there's, you can use it for free up to, I think you can do this, run this 10 times before you have to pay for it. Then it's $5 a month. Um, so not, not too big of a price point, but um, it does come in handy. So I'm going to show how, how you use this. So basically it helps you auto generate numbers based off of ranking of, of your field. So a little bit different than the auto number that will just automatically like put a number in there based on when it was created. And there's no way of re re um, ordering things using the auto number. So this auto ranker, you can see it here, let me bring it up full screen. So basically you'll just configure this, you'll pick the table, you can filter by a view, um, and then you pick the field that you want to use as your ranking field. Um, and that is um, the field that, um, that, that will be updated with your rank. And then you pick the sort field. So this determines how you're going to rank these things. So, so I'm, I'm ranking a, a project list and I'm using just all projects in the view. I could filter this to only be certain projects. And then I'm gonna insert into the ranking field and I'm gonna sort by the kickoff date ascending. So the kickoff date will determine the order number that I wanna give them. And you can add multiple rankings. So you can sort by one field, then add another field. And I believe you can add a few more fields, up to five fields. And then once you have that configured, um, you can rank them. So let's look at our data here. Um, so I've got my projects and I've got my kickoff date. And I want to basically insert a ranking for those um, these items based off of the sorted kickoff date ascend, ascending. So the earliest date will be one and then so on throughout. So once I click this rank items, it should populate this table. There they are. So now everything um, it has a number associated. Now you can use that number for whatever you need either to sort or um, or do anything else with them, use them inside of a formula to generate a unique formula value or whatnot. So it's a pretty straightforward app that allows you to auto rank on, um, on different things. It does require um, you to actually click the button to perform the ranking. Um, so it's not automated. Um, you could potentially do this with a uh, automation in some regard as well. But if you're looking for just kind of a quick way to do it, um, check that out. So I believe, you know, this is just the license key. Once you purchase, you enter your license key, then that unlocks it for unlimited use. And I believe that's all there is to it as far as uh, configuration. That's pretty straightforward. Auto rank. So again, you just click on add an app and then you can find it in there. And we like to highlight these apps. If you have an app that you're interested in us uh, exploring on the show, let us know and we'll, we'll do that in a future segment. So that is the AutoRanker app. Okay, our last um, advertisement is for the Built On Air community. So this podcast is under the Built On Air community. You can find us at builtonair.com. You'll find um, articles, resources, weekly updates, this podcast. Uh, in addition to the website, you can get a weekly newsletter of what's going on, but you can also join our Slack community. And that's what I want to promote today. If you join us, um, it's a free community to join. It's all Airtable users asking questions, helping each other. We'll talk about anything that's related to people using Airtable and how they can use that. And if I just go in, you see, we'll share stuff. Um, you'll see, let me go to the general. You'll see we're at 996. 
So I've been pushing to try to get to a thousand. We're four people off of a thousand. So I need four more people to join ASAP this week, hopefully. So if you have friends, if you're already in the community, tell your friends. If you're not in the community, sign up, builtonair.com slash join. We'll get you into this free community and you'll be able to help other people as well as get help and um, do what uh, and join all of us that are in there and many other people that um, are all Airtable enthusiasts. So please join us. We'd love to have you participate in our community, builtonair.com slash join. All right. Hopefully I stalled long enough for Camille and Ali. So on this episode, so we're doing, I'll talk a little bit about, you got a little more time, Camille and Ali. Um, mm -hmm. So Air Chefs is kind of a fun challenge where we'll go, we'll, we'll pit two uh, experts to see what they can build. I gave them a um, base from the universe before the show started, um, just before the show started. And I'll show that base. Um, I gave them a CRM template. So this is kind of geared towards the SMB space. This is from uh, Scott Hemeter, who I've actually met. We need to get Scott on the show as well to, to learn about what he's up to. But this is a pretty cool, he's an expert in CRMs. He came from the Salesforce world working and, and building uh, applications on top of Salesforce. And um, now is kind of uh, playing with Airtable and he built a CRM template for companies. So he has a lot of experience in working with um, CRMs. And this one is just kind of a generic um, base that is just kind of all the things that you would need as far as a, a CRM and everything like that. So you've got your organizations, your contacts, your opportunities, interactions, tasks, and leads. So he separates out leads um, from contacts and whatnot. And then it also comes with some apps to convert a web lead into a contact. That's kind of, I know he comes from Salesforce because I, I know that's how Salesforce works. A lot of other CRMs don't separate leads from contacts. Maybe those are more segments or views within the existing. So I, I kind of go, I, I see pros and cons to both of those approaches. Um, but this has an automation that once somebody is no longer a lead and you're actually engaged with them on the sales side, then you can run this this uh, script to convert them into a contact and get them in there. So with that, we're going to start with Ali and Ali's going to share your screen and we'll see what Ali could do with this base to make it her own and kind of see some fun stuff of see how an expert thinks when they when they are given a base to play with. All right. Share your screen. Yes. Am I? Am I sharing it? Not yet. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. It, I, I clicked it and then it I, a little thing popped up that said Chrome has lost permission to share oh. screen. You might have it. to refresh, yeah. Oh, no. Hold on one sec. I'm so sorry. You're um, good. Just see. giving Camille more time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> working on it. Okay, let's see. I need to screen recording. Is I it going to kick you out of the thing sometimes when? Yeah, um, you might have to refresh. Yeah. It, I, I don't, it's Chrome has permission. It's checked out. <laughs> uh, if you, uh, I'm going to hmm. Time. Let's try one more time. Joys of a live demo yeah. show. It's yeah, I am totally lost. It's telling me to go to system preferences and make sure that Google Chrome has permission, and it certainly does have permission. <laughs> hmm. I'm a bit lost. I While probably... you're doing that, we'll we'll go back to you might have to maybe refresh. It might kick you out for a second. That's okay. Right. Okay. Uh, while you're doing that, 
we'll get some correction here on, uh, from Justin. He's got some comments going about red jacks, which I know is everybody's favorite topic. Um, slash D extracts digits, not non digits. Yeah, that's that's what she was doing. Extracting the digits, not the non digits. The empty string at the end is ignored. Yeah, I think that's what we were saying. Red I, I might have said it backwards, but the right, result right. was what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. The source and the regex to match for extraction. The regex replace function takes a third argument for replacing the match pattern. Yeah, so there's a difference between regex extract and regex replace. Um, so extract will take out what you're matching, whereas replace will replace the matching part with something else. Yeah. I never use extract, not because it, there's reason not to use it. I just use replace all the time. Don't know why. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so no, look. no good news. It, I, I, I just got back and now it's saying it does not. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Cool. All right. My apologies, guys. Yeah. All right. We're in. Excellent. All right. So as Dan pointed out, I could not agree more with what you said about the leads. And that is actually the first thing I did was I totally cut this table out of, <laughs> of the schema. <laughs> um, so there were all of these linked record fields. I literally deleted them all. Um, because to me, I mean, my number one thing is I don't want to have to have information two times in a base. And if you have leads that you're then turning into a contact, you've got that information in two different places. You've got to make sure that you're moving those fields and the values over. Um, and then if you ever say like, oh, I want to start tracking like somebody's LinkedIn page, then you've got to add that field on both tables. Like it's just, it, it to me, it feels like too much. You're creating too much work for yourself. So if, I think having one, uh, contacts table and then you could have you know a type and have you know leads that come in get automatically assigned with a web lead tag um another thing i did was just clean up the schema a little bit um this is something i struggle with especially in a crm is making that decision on like for interactions for example do you want that to be tied to an opportunity or to a contact or both and i did leave it as both in this situation um and originally they had three linked record fields like it could be tied to an opportunity a contact or an organization but i changed the organization to a look up from the contact just to simplify those linking relationships a little bit when you've got too many linked record fields things can start to feel really confusing really quickly um and in addition i went and i added a couple formulas to uh, each of these names, because before they both said web lead submitted, and it was not unique. And then last but not least, I added a URL preview app. And I'm using this uh, formula of a shared Airtable view. So I have a shared view here on my contacts table. So I've just copied this formula and then I have that, I'm, I'm sorry, I copied that link and put it into a formula. And if you have a question mark and then filter, kind of like how you can pre-fill uh, forms, um, you can set up a little formula to filter that view and keep in mind that this is not secure. So please don't do this if you're thinking that you can share it with a client and have them just see their information. It's not exactly how, going to work that way, but this works out really well for this because when I click on Keeling Haley, I can now see all of my contacts for that company and the information about it with my app sidebar here. And as I click around, this changes. Now, the only downside here is if there's more than one organization linked to a contact, then they will not show up here because you can't use a find um, function in this filter by formula in the URL. Right. That's yeah, it. that's cool. I forgot about that filter trick. That's a cool trick. 
Okay. That works on the shared basis. Awesome. Very cool. Well done. Ali, Camille, you ready? Sure. Let's see what you got. I built an interface. An um, interface. Yeah. Uh, mostly so I could talk about stuff that was in the adjustments that were made recently. So I have uh, I have an, an interface page for the organization and I've grouped them in the side with um, the size and then sorted by name. So something I just now noticed while I was building this is that as you scroll, the group will stick to the top, which I just think is nice. Mm -hmm. And um, for each page of the um, organization that I'm flipping through, I've sort of have top information up here and I have the contacts. I haven't decided whether or not I like this, that they expand like that. I don't know. I feel like I'm being petty, but um, I've set it to only show three contacts per page because I don't need them super long. And then if I click, I can expand. Um, uh, That's the most there. you can do per page? Uh, I don't know. And also, if you have a lot of pages, you could do something like that and then mm. jump to that. Um, if I go into edit this really quick, rows per page, I think four seems to be the maximum. I don't know if that's four because that's the max, you know, for my particular thing. I don't think so. It might just be a maximum of four rows per page because otherwise that would get pretty long. Um, Ali, I think, pointed out that you could change the um, name field or the label rather for uh, each of these cards, which is nice. And you can turn off whether or not it displays the field names, which is also nice. Um, something that I hope is added to the regular calendar, not calendar, gallery views. Um, if I go back into preview, you can see that I've also included the list of um, interactions uh, had for this company. Um, I didn't really narrow down the fields that appear here. You wouldn't need to see organization again, for instance, um, just to give an idea. And then I, what I also did was made another quick page for the contacts. Um, and some people can have more than one organization. And what I originally was going to do was have a button field that you would be able to have here that you could click to get to that organization's um, interface page, but because people can have more than one, a button field wouldn't work. So instead, this is a roll-up field that you know outputs the name and then uh, a link to open the interface. Um, so hopefully, my screen sharing switched, yeah. and now we see this one. Um, yeah. I accidentally stopped sharing, but that's most mostly what I what I had completed. Awesome, very cool, good stuff. You can see in just a little bit of time, you can take an existing uh, base and and make it your own and add some cool functionality. So hopefully, that gave everybody some ideas. Let us know what you would do with that base. Um, and thank you, Camille and Ali, for sharing your expertise with us in the community. And I believe, let me bring this back up, that concludes. We'll end a little bit early today, but um, relatively quiet week in the, in the uh, Airtable world. But there might be more news coming in the next week or two. And then get your tickets to the uh, Daretable conference, and we will see you there in a month. And otherwise, we will see you next week live for episode 10. Thanks, everyone. Always excited to see what you build on air. Take care. Thank you for joining today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to check out our sponsor, ontair.com. And we will see you next time on the Built On Air podcast.